Montgomery patented his airplane design in 1905. He sent in the patent at exactly the same time that the Wright brothers sent in their patent to the US Patent Office. And in fact, through a lot of research we've done, it went to the exactly the same patent examiner in the patent office, a man named Townsend, William Townsend, who reviewed both patents and allowed both patents because he believed they had different mechanisms of wing warping. Montgomery went on to develop other, other designs by uh, helping David Wilkie fly, and, and other experimenters around the nation got interested in his design, specifically the Lockheed brothers. Lockheed spelled L-O-U-G-H, but ended up becoming Lockheed L-O-C-K, like we know today, Lockheed Aircraft. These were the brothers that started that aircraft company. They made a powered version of Montgomery's tandem wing design in 1909, 1910. I'll show you that in just a second. Here's the different patents. I just want to mention that the Wright brothers' patent actually was also a glider. They patented their 1900, 1901 design as a glider. It has no motor on it because they were specifically interested in patenting the wing warping control. Montgomery did essentially the same kind of thing very independently. They were patented almost exactly the same time. The Wright brothers filed in March of 1905, and Montgomery filed in April of 1905. This is the powered version that was flown in Chicago. It didn't get off the ground very well because the, the motor was underpowered for its, for its weight. So it would skim along the ground and basically kind of hop off the ground but never really achieve the flight that they were hoping for. At the same time that the, this success, unfortunately, the great quake of 1906 occurred. And that changed the lives of many people in the Bay Area, including Montgomery. He had to refocus his efforts on helping to rebuild the college, which was damaged in the earthquake, rebuild his own finances, and rebuild his own wealth uh, and his profession. He had to take a time off from doing anything in aviation to help the city recover. He did continue, however, later after the, after the earthquake in inventing other things in science. He invented a rectifier uh, and a, a patent to keep motors in step. He made some money from that. But at the very same time, there was growing public disdain for what the Wright brothers were doing. The Wright brothers had patented their patent, but they were specifically suing other people in aviation, like Curtis and Paul Han for anything impinging on their design. They felt that they basically owned aviation through their patent. Valerio was threatened to be sued. Many people in aviation were threatened to be sued, and, and the aviators thought that that was not right. And they recognized that here's this guy Montgomery who has an early patent as well. Maybe Montgomery could do something to help solve this situation. And that kind of brought Montgomery back into this whole aviation fray again. At the same time, he finally married. He was 50 years old. He finally married a lady named Regina Cleary at the age of 50. And so Montgomery, now wanting to develop a, a, an aircraft that could be outfitted with a motor, specifically designing a plane to make sure it had a motor, set up a new glider design called the Evergreen. It was being flown in Evergreen, California, near San Jose. Again, using a rail launch facility, which I'll show you in just a second. This is a very unusual glider because all of the control for this glider was in the wing. The tail, the, the fin-like tail was fixed. The elevator was fixed. It's just a flat, it's a parabolic wing in the back. And all the control, the roll and the pitch, is in the wing. He, he developed that, that, uh, that glider and then also made flights with his brother Richard and another gentleman named Joseph Vieira in, in this place in San Jose. This is the glider. Uh, it's a different sort of looking glider. Here's the front view of it at these hillsides near San Jose. Very fortunately, this hillside area has been preserved as open space. It's dedicated as Montgomery Hill in San Jose, and you can walk around these hills and kind of think about what it must have been like in 1911. This is the rail launch facility. You can see the glider on the wheels about ready to go to off this rail facility, down the hill to a takeoff, and then gliding down below to the valley below. This valley still exists. And there's a college out here now, Evergreen College. And you can land. But unfortunately, on one of these flights, they made 52 flights. And on the last flight, Montgomery was flying in the glider, went out into that little valley, and experienced what he called a whirlwind, uh, or what other people around the area called a whirlwind. But basically, it was a small thermal that took the wing, the left wing up, and he had not enough control to get back out of that and put him over just after 20 feet, put him over nose first into the ground at this, in this condition. And Montgomery died as a result of that crash. This was October 31st, 1911. The doctor got lost on the way to the field, which is never good, because they were practicing in a remote area. The doctor couldn't find his way. After the death, however, uh, the Smithsonian Institution recovered the glider, uh, restored the glider, and that glider is currently on display at the San Diego Air and Space Museum in its main hall. And I want to take you back to that third model glider that he made, that unusual glider that had the smaller wing. This glider looks a lot like that model glider, if you think about it. And his idea was to put a motor on the front 
uh, an engine on the front and fly this as a flying machine with a propeller. But that was never to be. There were others that wanted to experience the Montgomery designs. This is a Montgomery tandem wing glider that was made by the Geneva Aviation Club in Switzerland. This was flown at what was perhaps the first international glider meet in, in history. The takeoff location was in Italy and the landing location was in Switzerland. But there were also, after Montgomery died, there were lawsuits that were filed by the Montgomery heirs against the Wright brothers and against the federal government for patent infringement. The Montgomery heirs felt that Montgomery had been wronged through his life and they wanted to right that wrong. So they filed this two different patents, one of which went quite long to 1928 that was concluded in favor of the US federal government. But those lawsuits led the Wright brothers to mount a campaign to sort of marginalize Montgomery's contributions in aviation. And that didn't help his becoming forgotten in aviation history over time. But there have been recognitions over time. There have been two airports named in his honor, Montgomery Field in the San Francisco area near Chrissy Field. Right on Fisherman's Wharf, there used to be an airmail facility that was named Montgomery Field. There's also Montgomery Field in San Diego. Again, a, a move, motion picture, full-length motion picture was made in 1946 by Columbia Pictures called Gallant Journey. Uh, a very large silver wing Montgomery Moore Memorial was dedicated near Otai, near his family ranch, and he's been inducted in the National Hall of Fame for aviation in America. I want to take you back, though, and say that, you know, we started the, the, the discussion by saying that heavier-than-air flight was impossible and that people really need to think differently. And I look and I see model airplanes as being that easy way to experiment with lots of different things and try out new different things. And there are people like Robert Goddard who, inventing rockets, and thinking about new ways of doing rocket design, got to see his accomplishment come true, but he never got to see his vision of man coming to the moon. He never lived long enough to see that vision become a reality, unfortunately. But you look back to people like Leonardo da Vinci, all the way through Robert Gardner and, and our greatest aviators today, many, many, many of them started out making models, making aero models to test their designs, and thinking about new ways that were considered impossible but then became real. And so it's difficult to say what's impossible for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. And I'll say that all of that starts with model airplanes, because we know that's true. So Quest for Flight, the book was released in October. Uh, it's currently number one on the University of Oklahoma Press bestseller list. That happened last week. I'm very proud of that. Uh, it's available, again, through uh, Barnes & Noble and Amazon. And I'm on Facebook. If you're Facebook friendly, you can Google me or Facebook me, uh, Gary B. Fogel. Happy to have some likes. I spent a lot of time, and so did Craig Harwood, researching all this at the Library of Congress and at the Smithsonian and Santa Clara. We went all around the nation over the last 10 years to understand this story and put it together. It was a lot of effort. And I'd like to thank you and AMA. This is a picture of me when I was four, flying my AMA uh, Delta Dart, because that's what I started with. And so we all, hopefully many of you also started with this plane too and have continued on, but this was a good plane for me. So I thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions you have.